Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Seema Modi, correspondent at CNBC Business News. We certainly appreciate you joining us today here on LinkedIn. Uh, I am the co-host of Women and Wealth along with Patty Martell. This is an ongoing series where we dissect the biggest issues facing women in the corporate world and also explore ways uh, in which women can be smarter and more savvier investors at home and in the workplace. Patty? Yeah, and, and the reason why we're doing this talk is because obviously your career is one of the biggest investments um, that you're going to make, not just investing in your education, but also your time. I mean, I just I know how much um, time I spent um, in the office at work or thinking about work. Um, and we know I mean, this has been a long pandemic um, and it has disproportionately affected women, right? Whether it's the huge number that left the workforce to take care of their children and their families. Um, and that has a real cost to the economy. Um, you know, there, there was the, we had the great resignation and now there's this push, you know, in some companies to get like everyone back in the office. And I think, and that's really why we wanted to have this conversation with, with Reshma. Um, you know, she wrote about this in her book, Pay Up, and she's talking about the future of women and work. And, you know, she says we need real change, you know, to fix the burnout, to fix the inequity. Um, I'll just give you a little more background um, on, on who she is. Um, she's the founder of Girls Who Code and the Marshall Plan for Moms. She's a best-selling author um, and just a champion of female empowerment. Um, her, intro, her influential TED Talk, um, where she said uh, to teach girls to be brave, not perfect, um, has been viewed more than six million times. So let me bring her in. Reshma, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you. Um, welcome to Women in Wealth. Let me just start from the beginning. Why did you write this book? Gosh, because women are in crisis. Um, you know, during the pandemic, you know, over 11 million women left the workforce. Two years later, there's still, you know, over a million women missing. And, you know, so many women had to supplement essentially, you know, their, their paid labor for unpaid labor when the schools closed. And we live in a society that doesn't have affordable childcare, that doesn't have paid leave, that is fighting against flexibility and remote working. And so, you know, workplaces have never been designed for us. And I think that given the great resignation and the moment that we're in, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to finally make workplaces work for women. You know, which when we tend to focus a lot on CNBC uh, around wealth, creating wealth, accumulating wealth as women. And I'm just curious from the research you've done and also the countless conversations you've had with women across the nation, what are what are some of the mistakes that women make uh, when it comes to investing? Well, I mean, I still think that we uh, are taught to be risk mit mitigators. You know, we, you mentioned my talk, Bravery, Not Perfection. I mean, it's literally embedded in our DNA, you know, to only do the things that we're good at, to not take risks, to draw on the lines, you know, to not take up space. And so I think in many ways, we just haven't been taught uh, to be risk takers. And so when we invest, we want a sure thing. And as you know, I mean, I would say as an investor, most of the things that I invest in don't work. And so you have to be comfortable and okay with taking risks. And we just haven't taught our girls that. Yeah. But and that risk also extends, I think, just in kind of how we navigate our career, right? I mean, you know, I think we in, we talk about investments and, and finance, you know, we are risk averse, but but also, you know, in in terms of like maybe not going for that promotion that you, you're, you're kind of on, you're like, gosh, yeah, you know, I really don't know if I'm qualified. And, you know, where men have no problem, you know, raising their hand, <laughs> to play, you know, for promotions and, and for jobs that, you know, maybe are a little kind of beyond or, or, or push them to, you know, to um, expand their skill set. And women are still reluctant to do that. How do we change that? I mean, this is what's been broken about corporate feminism for a really long time. And this, you know, I saw this in the pandemic. You know, I found myself, you know, with two little babies, you know, running an organization and it nearly broke me. And I learned the hard way that having it all is just a euphemism for doing it all. And, you know, I spent the past 10 years telling girls to barnstorm the corner office, to lean in real hard, you know, that, you know, the corner office was just an express train. They just had to get on it. And we've been taught that all we have to do is color code our calendar and find a mentor and a sponsor and like cut in, we'll be right there. And, and so we've constantly been trying to fix women instead of fixing the structure. And so the reality is, is like we've always been prepared. You know, as you know, 72% of high school, you know, valedictorians are women. The majority of those that have their bachelor's degree are women. 
The majority of those getting their master's degree, their PhD are women. But we keep telling women, well, just take this course, take this class, you know, just do this one thing. And it's all a lie. And we've got to stop telling it. And it, it really means just upending everything that we have learned about women's empowerment, everything I've learned, you know, throw out the confidence code, stop doing a power pose. No, you don't need to quote lean in. You are already leaned in. And so it's a wholesale shift in everything we've learned, everything we've probably taught as leaders. Um, and, and, and we got to do it now because I think more than ever before, we need women's leadership. We need women to start companies. We need women to, you know, raise their hand for promotions that they may not feel like they're prepared to, but they are quite frankly qualified to do. We need women to step up in ways that we've never needed them before. You know, it's interesting in your book, you also detail how not only do women need to raise their hand and go for those opportunities, but they need to be strategic on how they handle conversations with their boss, the person they report to. Can you expand on that? I mean, managing that relationship, whether it's your team, your colleagues, but someone who you report to, um, how that can play a huge role in how they view you as someone that they want to promote over time. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that we don't celebrate our successes. We don't talk about our successes. We don't tell our bosses where we want to go because we've told, we've been basically taught to, you know, um, to be modest. You know, I always say, you know, go to any like sixth grade graduation. And when the boys get the award, they're like doing the dab. They're like, I got this. And what do we do? We're like, Who, me? You know, the, the first time when people are like, congratulations on your best selling book. I'm like, oh, I mean, I don't know. Was it good? And so, and so our oftentimes people don't know what we're doing and what we're working on. And, and, and because we're taught to not actually tout our successes. And so I think it's really important for us to be very clear about where we want to go, how we want to get there and what we need from people to help us get there. You know, people used to always say, well, with women, oh, don't be transactional. And I tell them, be transactional with me. You know, when you email, tell me what you want, how I can help you, who I need to email, where I need to send the check, you know what I mean? Because I'm invested in you. And it's so it's all these things that I think in many, in many ways that we've been taught that haven't been serving us. And to just a pinpoint on why you think women perhaps aren't always doing that, is it, does it come down to insecurity? It just comes down to not used to being so forthright? What, what do you think it is? That's not yeah, actually like we've, we, we've told women not to behave that way, right? Yeah. From, we've told them to not be bossy, you know, to be really nice, to be people pleasers, to not tout their accomplishments, uh, that that is not seen as, as attractive. And, and, and listen, in, Unfortunately, you know, when we see women leaders who are, have swag, you know what I mean, are actually, you know, uh, prepared and ready to lead, we often see them being clamped down uh, and being told to be quiet. And, and so we don't have a lot of good role models out there of women who have you, you know, done this successfully. And that, that's part of the problem. But unfortunately, I think laying in wait and waiting for someone to notice us and you know, being prepared and being ready and just hoping that somebody will notice you, that's not working either. Because we see so many, quite frankly, men that are just not as qualified as us, getting the job, getting the promotion, getting elected into that office. And it's too much and it's frustrating. Um, I, there's no better example of that, quite frankly, than the Supreme Court. You know, in, in, in terms of you know, what we've seen as, as a lawyer, and I, and I would say people who just don't know how to interpret the law. Yes. And of course, here we've been sizing up the, the corporate response to that Supreme Court ruling. Many companies coming out from Uber to Airbnb saying that they will cover the travel costs for women who cannot receive the services in the state that they are living in. Uh, I'm just curious what else you think co corporations can do? Look, I think it's a great first step, but I think we have to make sure that everything is not performative. You know, the reality is, is in the, in, in the next few weeks, 26 states are basically going to have an all but total a ban on abortion. That means half of the women living in America that are, you know, in reproductive age are not going to be able to access an abortion. Women are going to die. In fact, women are already dying. So this is an emergency, a national emergency. And so we have to actually take really, really, really bold actions. And so I am happy that you know hundreds of companies have said that they're going to, you know, pay for abortions, pay for travel. But like for Uber and Amazon, don't just do it for your employees, do it for your contractors. 
the contractors are the ones that are low wage, that are living in communities that are not going to have access to abortion or living in states you know, where abortion is not going to be available or safe. Um, so go over and beyond. Every CEO, don't make a quiet statement because you're worried that you're going to lose clients. Say it loudly and proudly and use the word abortion and use the word forced birth. Talk about really what is happening. This is about control over women's bodies. And fundamentally, you can't have equality. You can't have equity if we don't have control over our own bodies. And we got to also think out of the box. What are the other things that we should be doing? I want to make sure that corporations, you know, have a ban, quite frankly, on contributions of elected officials that are that are anti-choice. You know, and, and we know that it's one thing to make a performative statement, but then it's another thing to send a check. Um, and that has been happening far too often on racial equality, on voting rights. Um, and, and so it, it can't happen here. And so this is a moment where the private sector, quite frankly, has got to lead. Um, there's no other option. You know, I, I, this is a this is not a thing where things are going to change overnight. Yeah. This is a decade long, at least a generational fight. And in the in the 10 years that we figure out how to get our rights back, because that Supreme Court is young. You know, and those state legislators, you know, are, were, are those those areas are pretty red. And so the reality is, is that millions of women are going to die. Millions of women are going to die. Yeah. Rashima, I, I just want to go back um, to this, um, you know, this idea of, you know, obviously the pandemic is, is still ongoing. Right. And it's been it's going on two years now. We talk about how the number of women that have left the workforce. Mm. What is that going to do for the pipeline, right? Which was, we had a trickle, right? We had a trickle of women that were kind of working their way up. Um, and I think about, when I think about the number of women that have left, what does that do for the next generation of leaders or the, or the sweet suite? Like, how do we how do we recover that? It's devastating, um, you know, because the, the job numbers actually don't show how many people have downshifted their careers, how many people were, you know, in management or close to the C-suite and then the pandemic happened and daycare centers were shut down or their kids were broken because of mental health and they changed, you know, their path. And, and that I know so many women who've made that choice and, and you, that's not reflective in the job numbers. And so, you know, what I'm doing at the Marshall Plan for Moms is really figuring out, okay, how do we make structural change in companies to make sure we get women back? We did a survey with McKinsey and the number one reason why women left the workforce was childcare. And so I think in this moment, you know, we launched the National Business Childcare Coalition. Companies have an obligation to start providing childcare benefits, whether that's in the form of a subsidy, whether that's flexibility, whether that's paying for, you know, uh, Vivi or Bright Horizons or care.com. But you have got to solve parents' childcare problems. You cannot work unless you have childcare, period. Um, you know, secondly, it, it also comes in terms of, you know, paid leave. We are still the only industrialization that doesn't offer paid leave. Um, it comes in the form of there's still resistance towards flexibility, and remote work. The reality is, like I said, workplaces that were never designed for us. Something simple like school days are eight to three and work days are nine to five. So the women forever have been having to balance how they handle picking up their kids from school and doing work. Well, now the pandemic has showed us that actually you don't have to put women who are, again, two thirds of caregivers are women. You know, we gotta work on changing that quotient, but until then we have to like accept the reality of that and say, how do we make it possible for women to have their caregiving responsibilities? Sometimes it's children, sometimes it's elderly parents and work. Uh, and how are we gonna facilitate that? So instead of resisting it and saying, everybody back in the office, five days a week, every day, talk to you about the technology that you're building. Talk to me about the norms you're building. Talk to me about how you're going to make sure that, you know, you don't have a two-tier system, one for those that are accessing remote work and one for those that are not. How are you changing the way you have compensation and performance reviews? So we got to go beyond the past. We're not going back to the old normal. I, I feel like we, in, in some sense, you know, in, we are still getting this wrong, right? Like okay. I, I have friends that um, have children, have small children that were nursing and working. They came back and, you know, they were still nursing. And, um, you know, I, I literally, this one of, one of my, uh, someone I know was saying that the, the mother's room that had been converted was a, you know, a place where she can go and pump was a converted closet. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that. And then an, another, another woman at a, you know, huge, um, financial institution in, in, um, in New York, 
you know, they had, a, uh, there was someone going in, like a man going into the women's, um, into the mother's room to take phone calls because, you know, it was, it was quiet in there or something. I was like, how, how is this like still being tolerated? Uh, anyway, but it is, but it's happening, right? Like, I mean, we, we are, we are certainly getting some of these things still wrong. Um, and there, well, I mean, we've always got it wrong, right? Yeah. I mean, we've all, and, and listen, I, I felt like I prayed, I felt prey to that. You know, we knew that the implicit deal that we had to make as mothers to work in the workforce is that we hit our motherhood. So you didn't complain about breastfeeding in closets. You didn't like, it was fine for the man to go use the breast because it was the quietest place, right? You didn't talk about your kids. You didn't, you know, you didn't say you needed to leave for a doctor's appointment. So we have got to change that, especially as we are entering a point in our nation where we are forcing birth. You know, we have to ask ourselves, we are a nation that forces birth, that, you know, doesn't have paid leave, that doesn't have affordable childcare, that has a baby formula shortage. You know, it's just, it's all interconnected. And well, now we're forcing them back to work, right? Like you're forcing, forcing them back to work. Back I mean, to work, yeah. Back to work 10 days after having a baby. Mm -hmm. Where, we, what country do we live in? Meaning like we have got, you know, if we are about family values, then let's be about family values. Um, mm -hmm. And so for those companies out there, see much of your point that are like, I don't want to enter this conversation. It's very controversial. It's very partisan. Fine. Are you offering childcare? What's your paid leave program? You know what I mean? Are you resisting flexibility? How are you supporting parents? And so we got to start asking those questions. You, we talk about how we can manage it all, right? Be that caregiver, whether it's taking care of an elderly parent or as a mom, and at the same time, managing a demanding career. Um, you, you talk about in your book about how you lean on your partner and how you've actually had some really frank discussions with your husband, Nihal, who I know well, uh, about how to manage your time schedule, right? Creating a routine. Can you walk us through that? What's the advice for other couples out there? Well, I mean, the reality is one third of divorces are about the chores. And I will say to you, you know, uh, all of our couples counseling sessions are pretty much about this conversation. And the reality is, you know, my husband, Holly's wonderful. And I married the guy that was going to do the dishes that did the laundry. You know what I mean? Very clear. I asked these questions very clear. He asked me to marry him three times before I said yes for this very reason. And, but when we had a baby, you know, I took my paid leave and he did it. And so my to-do list went like this and his shrunk. And so we really had to talk and negotiate. So for example, you know, I do the mornings, he does the nights. But if I'm sitting around at 6 p.m., you know, eating a bowl of ice cream, watching Netflix, he'll be like, hey, can you warm up the bottle? Can you grab the diaper for me? And I get then roped back into his job. So I now at 6 p.m., I leave. I have my girls dinner. I go for a walk. I hang out with my dog. I do other things. I'm just out. And, and so I think for us as women, we, we have to create really clear boundaries and have no guilt about them. I can't tell you how many girlfriends I have that will go on a girl's trip, but then like, you know, buy all the groceries, make all the lists, do all this stuff and then leave. And we have to just go. They will figure it out. And, 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 and so much about equality, we've really never talked about. We've, we've had so many HBR articles and so many conversations on how to get a mentor, how to get a sponsor. But I think the, the conversation we need to have now is how do we advance gender equality at home? How do we get to a world where we have 50, 50 percent caregiving? And what kind of corporate policies, what kind of corporate conversations can we have to get to that world? Because I really do believe if we can get to gender equality at home, we're going to get to gender equality in the workplace. And it's also going to have people recognize these conversations that we're having on repro rights about how important and critical it is to give people, regardless of your position, you know, on choice, autonomy over their own bodies. And I, I think also, Rashima, that, that does require a little bit when you're talking about this 50-50, you know, uh, kind of breaking up of responsibility at home. I think that also requires a mind shift on women's part because a lot of times we just automatically take it on. We'll do it. You know, sometimes it's just like, well, I've been I've been doing it. I've always been doing it. So and probably too, it. right? We get and so happy when we yes. can do it all. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, every, when we go traveling, of course, I get, a, I'm packing for me, the kids, the dog, Nahal's just grabbing his bag. We go out and we get in the car and he'll be like, hey, did you get Sean's frog? And I know I look at him like, of course I did. Right. There's like this pride in that we, it's part of our identity. And so, but we've got to let that go. We got to let, as my friend Tiffany DeFu says, you got to let the ball drop. 
Uh, and we have to kind of shift and it goes back to perfectionism, you know, and, and, and again, like being a bad mom is the worst thing you can say to a mom. Right. And, and so we've kind of built up these tropes and culture about what it means to be a good mom. And it means a self-sacrificing martyr who does it all. And I think in this pandemic and with everything that's happening in the country, it's just it's too much. And it's why 51% of mothers say they're anxious and depressed. I mean, we have a we have a crisis in terms of suicide rates for moms, in terms of alcohol addiction, in terms of Adderall addiction. It's moms are in mental health crisis, and we because we think moms don't break, and because there's not space for us to like talk about it. You know, we are we are holding all of that in, and and this is happening. This 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 kind of breaking point is happening because of the fact that. We have no support. You know, a friend of mine from Argentina, she was saying, it's so weird in America. Like in Argentina, if you're a mom, you're a queen. If you're a mom of twins, forget about it, right? I would never use the word queen and mother to describe mothers in America, right? And we need to ask ourselves, well, why? Like, why is it um, that, again, moms in many ways are the most, the least resourced even if you think about workplace discrimination, right? The motherhood penalty is the reason why we have a gender gap in pay, but we don't talk about it that way. We like the image of the pay gap to be the women's soccer team, but that's that's not what the pay gap is about. Uh, we don't have practices against, you know, uh, essentially, you know, trainings against rooting out, you know, discrimination against moms in the workplace. Even though every single mom can tell you probably a weekly or a daily microaggression that's made against them because of their caregiving responsibility. Rachel, are there certain companies that you, that you think, maybe across corporate America, private or public, in your conversations that you would say are, are doing a good job at supporting women, especially as they become mothers? Uh, you know, we've seen, you know, have discussed the emphasis on bringing more diversity to Wall Street. Goldman Sachs now has a rule saying we will not take a company public unless the company on their board has someone who is racial, has racial or gender diversity. Uh, yeah. So that's that's happening. But what about paid leave? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think, look, I think there are a bunch of companies in our coalition that are doing great work. Syncrity Financial, you know, they they have supported flexibility and remote working. You know, they're taking a lot of like a lot of policies to think about how do they build a culture that supports parents. You know, Etsy, I think, is an example of, you know, they basically have both for their male and female employees are taking, you know, paid leave you know, in the same amount, right? And so I bet if you surveyed Etsy's families, they probably have more gender equality at home than other families. Um, you know, I, I think that there are still companies out there like Apple that don't have gender neutral paid leave policies. In today's age, that's unacceptable. Um, and I think for a lot of companies in financial services, it's one thing to offer paid leave and a second thing to gaslight men when they take it. And I think that that's what happens a lot. And so I think the, the question in 2022 is not like, are you offering paid leave? Who's taking it? Are you incentivizing taking it? What is the results? You know, are men taking it? Are you setting the example for it? Um, so we have to ask different questions so we can make sure that things are just not performative. The, the second thing is, is that and then when people take it, when women take it, when they come back, are they coming back at the same level? What are the promotion rates? You know what I mean for mothers. What are the compensation rates? You know what I mean for mothers. Uh, and so uh, these are things that so much of this is like is is cultural, and a lot of times is an algorithm. You want to root out the motherhood penalty? It's an algorithm. You know, it's not hard anymore to do this. You just have to have the will. Let me let me ask you um, a a hard question. Um, and and I say it, it's hard just because I have not. <laughs> Um, I have not gotten a good answer to this. H how do we deal with imposter syndrome? Oh, I hate that word. Yeah. I'm going to send you my TikTok. Okay. That. I'm gonna, okay. But I want to, I want to, I'm going to tell you the story real quick that I told yeah. you. Um, I was asked to do, give a speech, um, at Bill Gates' summit. And I was asked to give a speech between, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. And I remember thinking in the backstage, like, wow, I wish they gave me 12 minutes instead of 10. And then I was like, how did I become that person? And, you know, I have been in every single room. I've say I met, I've met every CEO, every leader, every president, every prime minister. And I'm like, you, what? <laughs> yes. 
And, but I see it's such a blessing. Like I wish yeah. I could take that knowledge and put mm-hmm. it because I think that we think that we are not ready, qualified, prepared to do the job. And we've never had a conversation about unearned privilege. And a lot of people hold their positions because of unearned, undeserved privilege. And so our imposter syndrome is a fabrication. It is a lie. It is something that we have actually been, you know, bought and sold. And so we have to stop giving any credence to that. Because if you simply look at the, you know, if we want to live in an American culture that's about a democracy and about a meritocracy, then let's live in a meritocracy. And if we were living in a pure meritocracy, we would be running the world. Um, and, and so we just have to, and I think so much of what I realized I've again been bought and sold, you know, is that, that I, that I need to take this one more, I need to take this class to learn how to be an investor. I need to basically read this book to walk into a room with confidence. I need to watch this Ted talk so I can learn how to be why. And instead of just saying to women, you're ready, go, go, you're ready. And, and, and so, cause men don't read, why are men not reading the same books we read? Why are men not taking the same courses that we, we read? Why is it still that the majority of leadership looks like the minority of this country? Like, we got to wake up to that. Yeah. And that means we got to really, stop, really, really, really change the language. Like, I, I say to this, you know, Patty, like, I will not actually answer that question anymore. If you want to invite me to, t- t- there are like 20 questions I'm not answering anymore. Um like don't give it, don't give it the priority it deserves. Like it doesn't deserve to be in that line of questioning. Yeah, and I tell what this the more we ask it, the more I we was part of the problem, it. right? I was the you know girls who code like you know brain like I was part of the problem because I really believed that, and 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 it's just and 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 I'm just I'm not entertaining that, and nor should any of us anymore. Biggest piece of advice, tips to women who want to build their wealth. There's a recession potentially looming right around the corner. Of course, paid leave is a huge issue. But as women try to build wealth, your biggest piece of advice or hot tips? I mean, I I would say, like, chase failure. You know, I always say Serena Williams sits at the edge of her ability and a coach who says, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. Everything I've achieved in my life is because I took big risks. I ran for Congress against an 18-year incumbent, got my ass kicked. I started a Girls Who Code organization when I did not know how to code. You know, I've been advocating for moms and economic policies, but I'm not an economist, right? Every single day I say something that's provocative, that gets me in trouble, uh, that makes me both lose friends and gain friends. Um, and, and that's the way that you have to live your life if you really want to make an impact. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's, let's end there. Reshma, that Good is, advice. that is, yeah, that is, this has been a really great talk. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for all the good work we're, do, we're doing. We got to keep pushing ahead. Reshma Sujani. Thanks, thank everyone. You, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. Bye.